G'day guys and welcome back to another episode. So in today's episode we are going to be talking about external power sources or portable power stations, specifically looking at this unit here by Bluetti. We're going to be talking about some of the features of this unit, what it can do, what it can power and how long it can last in an off-grid scenario. In addition to this we're going to be having a look at some of the targeted uh, buyers for this unit and most, most importantly seeing whether or not it can replace the tried and trusted petrol generator. So let's get straight into today's episode. So guys, as the title of this video suggests, today we're going to be looking at the new Blue Eddy AP200C portable power station. Now this unit has been out in the States for a little while now, however it is a brand new product to the Australian market. Now so from all reports, specifications and reviews, if this unit lives up to its reputation, then it's going to be a market leader in this category. So quickly before we start, I just want to share a disclaimer, so let's get into that and then we'll start the review. So in order to be fully transparent in this review, I do have to mention that Blue Eddy approached me and did provide this unit free of charge in return for this video. Now, I know I've kept this channel sponsor free and independent to date. However, there are a couple of reasons as why I chose to accept this product and do this review. If you're not interested in these reasons, skip to the time on the screen here now and you will go straight into the review of the unit. Firstly, I want to say that the sole reason I run and the reason I started this channel in the first place is to provide helpful information to other people who have similar interests. Now I try and find topics that promote conversation and discussion and then use my experience to provide my opinion and my knowledge on the matter in the form of these videos. Now secondly, I've been creating these videos now for about a year and a half. All the things that I use in the videos and the camera gear and equipment that I use has all been personally funded. Now I already have a Honda EU22i generator. Now I've done a specific video on that, outlining all the details and doing my review on that one. And the reason I've accepted this product today is I simply can't justify the expense of another unit that does a very similar job for the one-off video review for you guys. If I was looking for my first generator or portable power station, this would be something I would definitely consider purchasing myself. However, with the existing unit I've already got, it makes it very hard to justify something at a similar price when I've already got that Honda generator. So guys, I specifically and directly asked Blue Eddy what their expectations were in this deal when offering me this unit. Now they've simply asked for the name of the unit to be in the title of this video, a video review of the unit itself, and also a link to their products in the description below. Now that's it. I can say whatever I want about this unit and I can review it in any manner that I find appropriate. Now whether or not you guys believe me, I hope that over the last year and a half I have managed to build the trust with my long term viewers here to be trusted in this review. So I will disclose that I've only had the unit for two weeks, so all my experiences and my testing has only been conducted in that short period, so I won't be able to comment on the long term reliability or the long term use of this unit. But perhaps if this is a popular topic, we can talk about that in the future. So guys, let's start by having a look at this unit here. Now the most apparent observation here is the size of the unit. It's no small unit, and that's just due to the size of the battery and the electronic componentry inside. Now the dimensions of this unit here are 42 centimeters wide by 38 centimeters high by 28 centimeters deep, and it weighs a decent 27 kilos, which is no lightweight. Now when we compare that here with the Honda generator, which is the EU22i model, we're looking at a dimension there of 51 centimeters by 42 centimeters by 29 centimeters deep. Now this also comes in a weight of 24 kilos when you've got that fuel inside and it's ready to run. So you can see here, comparatively, they're very, very similar in their specifications and their dimensions. An observation we can make here with the Bluetta unit is its shape. We can see here that it is a nice rectangle box type shape, which makes it very, very easy and convenient to pack into the back of your car or into a caravan or trailer. Now it's got two handles inbuilt into that shape here, which makes it super easy to lug around that 27 kilos and also integrates nicely into the design of the unit. The only negative here with the two handles that the Bluetti has compared to the single handle of the Honda is that it does almost always require a two hand lift, whereas with the Honda, you can just carry this around with one hand. Saying this, however, one complaint I have with the Honda unit is its dimensions and the way in which it's designed. This rounder shape and the narrower depth makes it a little bit unsteady uh, on its space there and also hard to pack things in or around the unit when you're not using it. The reason I say it's a little bit unsteady is when I had my 105 series Land Cruiser, this unit actually uh, upturned while I was driving, rolled through the back of the car and cracked one of the plastics on the inside of that rear cargo area. Not only that, but it also spilt fuel all over the back of the vehicle and made a big mess. 
So it's now time to talk about what's inside this unit and what makes it a little bit different from everything else out there on the market. This is where it becomes interesting. So inside this box here, we have a 2000 watt hour lithium iron phosphate battery. So that means that we've got a really, really safe battery in here that's gonna hold that voltage all the way down until it's reserve cut out. Now this battery is rated at 3000 cycles to 80%. So what that means is that you can charge and discharge this battery 3000 times and it's only gonna lose 20% of its battery capacity. So that means that you could charge and discharge this battery every single day for eight years and you're still gonna have 80% capacity of this battery remaining, which is very impressive. So inside this box, we also house a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter. And this inverter is rated for 4,800 watts of surge power and two and a half thousand watts for a period of two minutes. So again, a very, very healthy and respectable sine wave inverter in there. And we're gonna be testing out some devices a little bit later on to see how that performs. Now all the components and systems within this box are all maintained and viewed through this LCD screen front and center on the box. This LCD screen will show more information than most people will ever need. So let's go in and have a look at what it does show. So starting off with the home screen here, the battery level in percentage is shown in the center and pressing that display will bring up some information about the battery management system. The center icon is surrounded by four inlets or outlet icons and touching each of these icons will open a new window displaying more information regarding each of their status. On the top left, we have the inlet referring to the output provided by the solar or the 12 volt car charging methods. On the top right, we have the input referring to the power coming in from the AC charger. On the bottom left, we have the load consumed by the DC outlets. And on the bottom right, the load consumed by the AC outlets. The home screen also allows for the AC and DC outlets to be turned on and off separately. This initiates the componentry inside for the relevant outlet and displays the indicator bars to the associated icon. When a load is plugged in, the watts consumed will also be shown on the screen. And this is very helpful when determining how long you can run certain appliances for. Moving into the settings, this will give you an option to change the input from 12 volt to 240 volt and solar, allowing you to enter or disable the eco mode, which will turn the unit off after four hours of inactivity, and also the language, audible buzzers, time and date settings. The data tab allows for information on the unit, including the model and software versions, and the inverter and charge information will display the same information as shown when we entered those icons from the home page. The BMS management will also show you the same information as previously shown when selecting the battery percentage from the home screen. The fault history will allow you to view any of the fault codes, identify any of the issues and log the times. You can also clear the fault codes from this menu and selecting the faults page will allow you to display a six page list of all the possible faults and will tell whether or not any have been activated. This will be shown by an orange light displayed on the right hand side. So let's move on to some of the ports that this unit has on the front of it. And one of the great things about this unit is you can discharge the battery through both DC power and AC power. And what's even better is you can do both at the same time if you want to as well. So starting on the left hand side here, just underneath our power button, we can see our first DC 12 volt output. And this one here is rated to 25 amps. Now 25 amps is quite a lot for a 12 volt device and can power something up to 300 watts. Moving on here, we have two more uh, DC outlets, which is your 12 volt, 10 amp cigarette lighter. It's just a standard cigarette type fitting that you would find inside your vehicle. We also have here two 3 amp 5.5 mil connectors as well. So moving along, we come across to our power delivery port and this is rated to 60 watt, which is fairly significant and comes in the form of a USB-C connector. Moving along from there, we have four general standard USB points and each of those pairs are rated at three amps. Now one really cool thing about this unit is in addition to all those 12 volt DC ports we have there, we also have two wireless charging pads up on top of the unit as well, and each of those are rated to 15 watts. So grabbing any smartphone or any other wireless device, just by placing it on top of the unit there, you're gonna be able to charge your devices, which is a very handy little feature. So moving on to the right hand side of this unit, we can see here the pair of 240 volt AC outlets. Now this here is gonna power most of your household appliances just fine. And the fact that we've got that 4,800 watt surge power means that if you do have a normal air conditioning in your van and not a soft start aircon, it should be able to start that up and power that as well. Having a 2,500 watt continuous for two minutes, I mean, it's gonna be really, really good for some of those really power hungry, high powered appliances. 
So these units here are sometimes referred to as solar generators, and this is just due to their portability and the fact that they have numerous ways of being charged and their primary charging being solar, keeping it able to be fully charged off grid. Now, according to Blue Eddy, there are five different ways to be able to charge this particular unit. So let's quickly talk about each of those now. So the first method of charging is just gonna be from your standard AC 240 volt wall outlet at home. Now Blue Eddy do supply the uh, AC charger and we can see here that it's quite a large unit, but that's because it does allow for charging at a d fairly decent rate. This unit here will accept up to 500 watt and through my testing, I've seen about 460 watt being accepted from that standard AC adapter. So this means that it should be able to charge the unit in about five hours from completely empty. Now the second way to charge this unit here is via solar and this is where this unit is much of a market leader in that regards. This unit here can accept up to 700 watt of solar and that's at 150 volt. So that means that you can wire multiple solar panels into series and it will accept as much solar as efficiently as possible through the onboard MPPT charger. Now we're gonna go into solar charging in a little bit more detail later on in this video. However, again, it's just by plugging into the lower left-hand side of this unit down here through an aviation style connector. And that again is provided by Blue Eddy when you buy the unit. Now, if you were gonna be charging at 700 watt, you're only gonna be looking at about two and a half hours to charge this thing from empty to full if you have optimal and maximum solar conditions. Now the third way to charge this unit is just via your vehicle while you're driving. So this unit can be charged off your 12 volt battery just through a normal cigarette plug. However, this does take some time, anywhere between 16 to 20 hours on 12 volt and about eight to 10 hours on 24 volt. So although it is an option, it might not be a viable one if you are looking at camping up in the same place for quite some time. Now the fourth option for charging is just via a regular gas generator like the Honda EU22i I have here today. That will be the same charge rate as AC power, and it's just a matter of plugging that AC power brick into the side of this unit. And the fifth and last way of charging this unit is just via an external 12 volt battery. You can just plug it straight off another battery, uh, independent to a vehicle, and again, charge it. And you're looking at the same rate there as the car charging method. So another thing we have to take into consideration with this unit is the lithium ion phosphate battery. Now we know that we can drain this battery all the way down, nice and low and still maintain optimal voltage, meaning that our appliances are still gonna be charged and used very nicely. However, once it hits that 10% mark, it's gonna shut itself off to protect the battery itself. So if we take that 2000 watt hours that is possible with this unit and remove that 10%, we're gonna end up with 1800 watt of usable power remaining, leaving that extra watt just to protect the battery there at the end. Now, in addition to that, we also have to factor in the efficiency of the electrical componentry inside the unit. So what I mean by this is the electrical componentry inside this unit here does draw some power as well, just through those AC and DC inverters. So if we use the Blue Eddy calculation here, which is 88% efficient, meaning that 12% of the power drawn while using items will be drawn by the componentry inside this box. So if we take our 1800 watt and multiply that by 88%, we're left there with 1,584 watt hours of usable power inside this battery. So this leaves the big question as to what this unit can power and how long it can power certain devices for. So just for an example, I've got a range of uh, household appliances here and we're gonna plug this into the Blue Eddy, see if it can power it and see how much power it does draw. So we've got a kettle, a toaster, an espresso coffee machine, and also the infamous hairdryer, along with a 12 volt water pump down there on the ground, which is gonna source a couple of these appliances as well. So let's one by one, plug them into the Blue Eddy and see how we go. So first up, we're gonna start with the kettle. Now we'll just plug that into our AC port, and we're also gonna grab our 12 volt pump that's on the ground, which does run on uh, DC power, and plug that in. So plugging those in, we're gonna turn on both our DC power and our AC power, and we're ready to go. So I'll grab this water pump, click that on. We're gonna put about a liter of water into this kettle. So we'll turn the water pump off there and I will start up this kettle. So one thing you'll notice when you do plug in a high powered device like a kettle here, and we can see it's drawing just under 1900 watts of power, is the fan on the unit itself will turn on automatically. Anything over 1500 watt draw or an increase in the temperature inside the unit will turn on the onboard fans. So we'll let this boil away and see how we go. So there you have it, 
A couple of minutes, we've had that kettle boiling, we've got a litre now of boiled water. So if you were out camping, for example, that would be a lot more convenient than setting up a stove and a lot quieter than setting up a generator. But in that process there, we've used 6% of the battery and as soon as that kettle turned off, so did the fan within that unit. Okay, so the toaster's all plugged into the AC outlet now. We'll chuck that on and see how we go. Now straight away we can hear the fan hasn't turned on, so we're assuming that it's only going to be a small power draw. And we're looking at a power draw there of about 780 watt. So it's not a whole lot, and uh, in a couple of minutes we'll have some fresh toast. So there we go. Toaster's finished its cycle, and in that process we only used 1% of the battery because we we're only drawing just over 700 watt of power. So fairly efficient there, the unit's done its job, we've got half our breakfast cooked. So most importantly in the morning, when you're out camping or you're out off grid, is coffee. So for a lot of people, people love taking their coffee machines away from them, away with them. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in our coffee machine here. So we've got our water plugged into our coffee machine here. Now when you turn these units on, they do take a little bit just to heat up. So straight up we can see we're drawing already 1150 watt just by heating this unit up. Now heating and cooling is always going to be the most demanding on these units. So we'll let the unit heat up. We'll get our pod ready, get our cup, and wait for it to go. So now the unit's heating up, it's now putting that uh, water pump on into the uh, coffee machine there. We'll get a nice espresso coming up at 1200 watt. So there you have it, your coffee's finished. You've now got a nice coffee on the go. You've got your boiled water, you've got your toast done, your breakfast is halfway done, and all we've used is 8% of that battery in the unit here, and we're down to 92%. So the last thing is, before you head out for the day while you're off grid, the missus wants to dry your hair after having a shower. So that's where the, uh, the infamous hair dryer comes into it. So let's plug it in and see how we go. Okay, so we're just gonna start this off on a low heat and a low fan speed, and we'll work our way up. So just on a low fan speed there, we're going to be looking at about 430 watts. So it's not too bad, but that is again just low heat. Turn the fan speed up. We've gone up to 530 watts. So it's still very manageable for this unit. And they're going up to a medium heat. That's where it's going to jump to about 1,000 watt of power usage. So definitely a little bit hungrier, but still managing it just fine. Now one more setting on this hairdryer, putting it up to maximum heat. You are going to be drawing 1930 watt of power, so that is very significant and it's getting right up there in the capacity for this unit. So this power station powered all of these AC appliances just fine, albeit it can't do a couple of the power hungry ones together just because of that 2000 watt maximum. However, each product individually was just fine, including the water pump down there on the ground to supply some of these appliances. So overall, fairly happy with that. So those AC appliances are just an example of some of the things that you can power with this unit. However, it is definitely possible to uh, calculate how long or whether or not this unit will be able to power your specific device. So in the world of four-wheel driving and touring in Australia, we generally use amp hours as a calculation to figure out how long something would last for on a particular setup. So for example, if we had a fridge here that drew, uh, say, three amps per hour, and we had a 100 amp hour battery underneath the bonnet as an auxiliary battery, then we could just get the 100 amps divided by three amps, giving us roughly 33 hours of runtime with this fridge, ignoring any efficiency or battery reserve capabilities of that battery. Now for this unit here, it's just not possible to use amp hours as an accurate power measure because we are using 12 volt and 240 volt from the same unit. So we have to convert that into watt hours. Now we can, it's very easy to determine how many watt hours any device, whether it be 12 or 240 volt uses, you just need a basic understanding of the electrical system. So in essence, we have voltage, amperage, and watts. So the voltage is how much pressure or how much electrical force is in the system. So for an example, if we use the example of a garden hose, when you turn the tap on at the wall, the hose is pressurized and there's force behind that hose, but if you're using a trigger sprayer, there's no water is gonna be coming out. Now amperage or amps is the flow of that electricity through the cables. Now, for example, if we're using a garden hose scenario again, if we open up that trigger, we're gonna get some water exiting the hose. Now the faster that water exits the hose, the higher the amperage in the example of the electrical system. Now a watt is a unit of power, and it takes into consideration both the voltage and the amperage that a particular appliance can draw, and it's simply worked out by multiplying the voltage and the amperage to give us the watts used. 
Okay, so let's go through an example here. Say we have a 12 volt fridge that draws five amps per hour. So therefore we need to go 12 volts times five amps, and this will give us a total of 60 watts of power. Now, we worked out before using this uh, Blue Eddy battery here as an example, that our usable power is at 1,584 watts. So in order to get how long we can run this fridge for, we have to get 1,584, divide that by 60, and this would give us a total of 26.4 hours of runtime with this particular example. Now for 240 volt appliances, it's generally a lot easier. 240 volt appliances are generally stamped or marked with a wattage rating when you buy the product. It's not always exact, but it gives you an idea of what it will use and its maximum rating. For example, the hairdryer we were using before is rated to 2000 watts, which is the maximum of that inverter on this battery. So to work out how long this would run for if we were to run it continuously on the Blue Eddy system, we would then get our 1,584 usable watts of power in this battery, divide that by 2,000 watts of the hairdryer, and this would give us 0.792. Now in order to find out how many minutes this would run for, you then simply multiply this by 60, and this would equal 47.5 minutes. So therefore we'd be able to run that hairdryer continuously on the Blue Eddy system for 47 minutes before we run out of time. So the question now is, who is this unit designed for and who might get a benefit from this over, say, purchasing a standard generator? So perhaps you're just looking for some extra battery capacity in your setup or you're looking at powering multiple devices over multiple vehicles, then this unit might be the way to go without having to buy and start up a noisy generator at camp. Now perhaps the most applicable and most common market for this unit is going to be the caravan and RV market. So let's have a look and see what it can do there. So we've brought the unit out with the Jayco Discovery and we're gonna see how much we can plug into this unit, how much it will power and how long we can last off grid. So let's jump on in and get started. Now just remember when powering a caravan here in Australia, if the outlet port does not suit a 15 amp connector like the caravan port, then you will need to use an RCD protected connector like this unit here by Amphibian. The link for this will be in the description below. So the unit is all plugged in now, and the great thing about this unit over a generator, you don't have to move it a long way away from your caravan to keep that noise down. You can have it right next to your door, or right next to the van, and it's gonna be nice and peaceful. Now what we're gonna do now is jump on inside the van and start turning on some appliances to see how much power they draw, and try and work out roughly how long we can stay off grid using a system like this. The unit has started up, now remembering that we manually have to activate the AC function on the unit to produce power. Once we have done this, the first thing we'll notice is that the output goes straight to roughly 138 watts, and this is the onboard battery controller charging the 12 volt batteries. Given that these batteries are already fully charged, a few moments later, this output went back to zero. Now the first electric appliance that we're going to draw power from is the three-way fridge, using the 240 volt AC power function. We know this appliance doesn't draw too much, so we're going to go straight to maximum here, and we can see here it only draws 184 watts. This means we can power this fridge alone from a fully charged battery for just over eight hours. Moving on to the single electric stove element. Starting this on low or number one, we see a power draw of about 90 watts. Moving up to power three, we see about 230 watts and on its highest setting, drawing a maximum of 850 watts. This would mean that from a fully charged battery, you could power this stove on maximum for almost two hours. The next electric appliance we're going to try on this van is the electric heating element within a suburban hot water unit. This unit heats approximately 22 litres of water in a tank within the system, and once that a temperature has been reached, it will turn itself off and on to maintain this temperature. Turning this unit on now, we are drawing about 1242 watts, meaning that we could power this unit continuously, which is not required, for about an hour and 15 minutes. Now we're going to move on to the air conditioning unit within this van. Now unfortunately, I couldn't get the air conditioning compressor to power on during this testing as the ambient temperature was too low. So instead, I decided to use the heating function. Generally, most appliances will use more power for heating than cooling, and I would be very confident to say this would be the case with this unit too. So turning the unit onto heat, we observe it to draw 1400 watts, which means we could run this unit for a little over one hour. Moving on to the microwave and turning it straight onto a standard 30 second cycle, we observe it to use 1517 watts of power. 
This means we could heat something for one hour if we felt the need. Now plugging this unit into the general 240 volt input port of the van activates all your 240 volt GPOs within the van. So whether you're charging your laptops, phones or media systems or just want to make some toast or boil the kettle, this can all be done from a standard 240 volt outlet within the van, just as if you were at a caravan park. Here we can see the kettle again is boiling at 1930 watt, which gives us plenty of time to boil many cups of coffee. So I was also very interested to test out Bluetti's claimed 2 minute continuous power at 2500 watt, as this would make this inverter more powerful than that in my Honda EU22 generator. The caravan allows me to add certain appliances to reach this maximum, so here I've used the 240 volt kettle, the fridge on maximum AC power, and turn the electric stove element to power 3, resulting in a total draw of 2436 watt. We can see that the start of the test is at 0009 and we can watch the time here. Now while we wait, you will also notice that the fault button has turned orange and the unit is sounding its audible alarm, indicating the inverter has been overloaded. Nonetheless, we are going to continue the test. Now coming up to that 2 minute mark and almost exactly on time, the unit shuts off its AC power due to the overload. Now if we go into our data menu and look at the fault history, we can see the fault code 01031 occurred at the recorded time. From here, we can clear this fault, however we can also scroll into the faults list page and scroll across to page 4 where we can observe an orange light next to the inverter overload function. So there we have it guys, you can see in there that this unit powers a whole lot of caravan and RV type appliances, albeit not all at the same time. However, a combination of a few or many low powered loads are going to work perfectly on this unit. Now in addition to caravans and RVs, there are some other categories that may get some benefit from a unit like this. So the first category is going to be the basic camper or the occasional camper. And this is just someone who camps out of the back of their car or maybe has a stock car and hasn't invested in a, a, a comprehensive or an extensive 12 volt system. This unit here is going to be able to power all the basic stuff you need, still has the ability to charge via the vehicle itself or via solar and is going to give a few extra comforts to that basic camp setup. The added fact that it's all the componentry is inside one box and protected and the portability, portability of it is going to provide a huge benefit for those types of people. Now the other category is a backup power for your home. A unit like this is going to be able to power all your essential services at home as well. Now I did a quick little test on this. Let's have a quick look at what I've plugged in and what I powered at my house when I had a blackout. Okay, so the power's out of the house now. All the mains power has been switched off. Now it's time to rig up a few of these extension cables and power boards we got just to supply some of our essential appliances and see how much load that brings onto the unit. So at the moment guys, we have the fridge plugged in, we have our home internet and security system plugged in, the entire working station area, and we're currently playing a show running off Netflix through that internet modem, and we're only drawing 207 watts. So there's only one tenth of what this unit can power. So you can see during a blackout how essential this could be. So you can see here, even with all those accessories on the TV, the desk, the internet, the fridge, the two work lights, we're still only drawing 360, 370 watt of power. So what this means guys is you're still going to be able to boil a kettle if you take these lights out, make yourself a coffee, sit down on the couch and still enjoy streaming internet Netflix during a power outage. So we can see there it does power the essentials, you have a few comforts there as well and it's going to be really handy for those unexpected situations, especially at night when you just can't power that generator without annoying all your neighbours. So guys, after some of this testing, we've managed to draw down some power from this battery, which means now we're onto charging it back up again. Now, in addition to the AC wall outlet charger and the 12 volt car charger, solar panels are gonna be your most ideal charging solution for when you're off grid and away from civilization. So what I've got here today, guys, is three 250 watt panels. Now, these are quite large and generally will not be the type of panels that you'd be driving around in your four-wheel drive or your van. However, what we can do is we can try and maximize the amount of solar that we can put into this unit to see how it performs. Now, unfortunately today, it's not exactly ideal conditions for solar input, but we're gonna give it a go anyway. Now on the back of each of these panels and on the back of any solar panel you buy, you should have some information about the panel itself, its wattage and its voltage. So with these panels here, we're looking at about 30 volts per panel. And today we're gonna to be wiring them in series, which means we're gonna be connecting the positive to the negative one, and then this positive to the negative that one, and we should end up with a positive and negative on each side of this array. 
Now what that means is we're also going to be combining that voltage through all the panels. So we've got three panels here and running at 30 volt. We're looking at 90 volt running through the system and back into the unit. Okay guys, so this is what it looks like behind the array. Now it looks a little bit confusing, there's a bit going on, but it really isn't as confusing as it looks. So let's go through how I've wired these up. So on the back of each of these solar panels here, we've got a small little control box, and coming out of that we have two wires, that being a positive and a negative. Now in order to wire them in series, and this goes for any type of solar panel, whether these big fixed ones or a small folding panel, all you need to do is get the negative or positive from one panel. So in this case, we've got the negative from the first panel connected to the positive of the second panel. We've then got the positive, uh, the negative of the second panel connected to the positive of the third panel. This is going to leave us with a negative terminal on one side spare and a positive terminal on the, on the other side spare. We then plug this into our MC4 to XT90 connector, and that then plugs into the XT90 connector that plugs into the aviation port on the input of the Blue Eddy. Now making sure in the settings page we've set our input to be PV, which is the solar input, then we're gonna start seeing those solar gains straight away. Now like I mentioned, we're not really in ideal conditions today, but we'll give it our best shot to try and maximize it up. Unfortunately, off camera, I have seen a maximum of just a 660 watt, which is right up there, up underneath its 700 watt maximum. And we're getting an average input voltage of about 90 volts. So we're looking really good for these panels here. So that's some of the power these solar panels can bring in. Now, a couple of things that are really handy about this Blue, Blue Eddy system. First of all, it can take dual charging. So what that means is we can go and get our AC wall plug charger, plug that into the unit at the same time as these solar panels are bringing in power, which means we're gonna have two types of power incoming into the Blue Eddy, and it's gonna essentially speed up that charge time. So we can see there, we're bringing in up to 580, 600 watt of solar coming in when the panels are in optimal conditions, and then we can add another 460 watt of AC power coming in as well, really bumping that up to almost 1,000 watt of input charge. Now keep in mind we've got an 1800 watt hour of uh, usable battery there, so we can charge this battery in less than two hours if we use the dual charging method. First of all, you do have to wire at least two panels in series together. This is because the voltage needs to be up around the 35 mark in order for the unit to pick up the incoming input and then start charging the system. So here we've only got 30 volt per panel and it'll be similar or even less for those portable panels that you do carry in the back of your four-wheel drive or your van. So therefore having two or three of them will definitely help and you can put out a small array when you get to camp. Now second thing is you don't ordinarily carry these three 250 watt commercial size panels around with you at, in, in your vehicle or on your van. With this in mind, these panels here only cost me $300 secondhand from a building that was being demolished. So I could easily mount these onto a frame in my backyard, have them permanently mounted, which means if I wanted to, I could use this Blue Eddy power station as a backup for some essential services, inside, essential appliances inside my house in the event of a, a, a power outage. Now thirdly, Blue Eddy are coming out with their own branded solar panels, and these are gonna be of a folding type, similar to the ones that I already have. And these are gonna be easily wired in series together. And you can buy, say, four of these units, wire them in a small array next to your off-grid setup, and you're gonna have a really, really good input charge into that power station while you're off-grid in a very compact form. Four of those panels folded up are only gonna take up a little bit more room than, say, a 20-liter jerry can that you'd need if you're taking a traditional generator. So this brings us to the big question, can this unit here replace the tried and trusted petrol generator? Now look, I don't think the technology is quite here yet with the battery powered unit. It definitely has its benefits and there are scenarios where it's gonna provide a huge advantage to some people. However, I don't think it can completely replace the petrol generator. As the name suggests, it's a generator. It's going to generate power. In a day like today when we don't have much solar input just because of the haze and the cloud, that thing is still gonna be able to provide and power all of our appliances, whether it's a basic setup or in the caravan. This one here, although it can provide that, you do have that limited battery capacity. Now look, let's go over some of the benefits from a unit like this. The first one here is its compact size. We can see here it's not much bigger than the Honda generator there, and everything is protected inside of it, and all your componentry is in one nice, portable, easy to move unit. Now the second one as well, it can power many low loads, and obviously a basic solar system is gonna be able to replenish the power and keep it going for quite a long time. Now it's gonna be quiet at night. This is gonna be able to allow you to use appliances or devices that run off uh, inverters at night without having to start up a generator. And in some shared campgrounds in Australia that just simply isn't allowed using a generator. So a unit like that is gonna provide a huge benefit there. 
Now a huge benefit to the battery unit here is the fact you don't have to carry around a secondary fuel source. My vehicle here is diesel, I don't have to carry around that 20 litre petrol jerry can to fill up the Honda generator, which I can't store inside the car without stinking out the car anyway. Now the second advantage to this is the fuel source is going to be finite. So if you're going out off grid for an extended period of time, you're only going to have as much power in that generator as you do fuel. Now if you're in a good weather condition and you're able to maximise that solar, you essentially have infinite power supply with this here, with the ability to store that solar power in the form of the battery. Another big benefit is that solar input. It is a market leader with 150 volt and 700 watt of solar. However, the one negative here is that you do need at least two panels generally wired in series to hit that 35 volt minimum in order to charge this unit up. Now the couple of negatives with this unit, obviously weight being the first, however, it is very comparable with the Honda generator. The limited solar input or the limited input you can put in while you're off grid, being the fact you don't have that petrol power source like you do with the generator. And the other fact is you still have to carry solar panels. Now that granted the solar panels are gonna be a little bit more universal and practical than carrying petrol. However, you do have to carry that extra componentry in order to power this up off grid, just like you would have to carry petrol for the generator. So guys, for a unit like this, you are looking around the 2600 Australian dollar mark, which is no cheap price. However, when you consider what you get inside that unit, it is fairly reasonable. Now, when you consider in Australia, a high quality 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter will set you back about 1500 to $2,000. This unit here being only a little bit more than that, you also get included a very high quality and very high input MPPT charger for your solar, and you also get that lithium ion phosphate battery all packaged up in a very portable and protected unit. In conclusion, this unit definitely has its benefits and it's gonna suit some people really, really well. It really depends on who you are and what you plan on powering as to whether or not this unit will benefit your setup and will work for your circumstances. If you're someone who likes to power lots of low to medium or moderate loads, then this unit's gonna be able to do that very, very well and you should easily be able to replenish the power used through your general solar input. If you are someone who looks at powering high powered loads constantly through their van and you really want to power things like air cons and microwaves for an extended period of time and into the hours of darkness, then you're really going to need to stick with that petrol generator. Now for my two weeks of testing, I've found everything's worked really, really well on this unit. Nothing has broken both internally and externally. Now obviously we have set off a few fault codes during our testing, but a quick reset of the machine, just as the instruction manual suggests and the system comes straight back online and works as it should. I'm very impressed with the build quality and the functionality and portability of this unit and it would be definitely something I would have considered before buying a petrol generator given the type of camping and off-grid uh, living that I do when I go camping. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this review. I hope it's given you something to think about if you are looking at portable power stations and maybe it is an alternative if you are considering a generator. This unit here is definitely going to be a lot quieter and a lot cleaner and doesn't take up any more or less room than that typical power generator. However, you don't have to carry on that fuel source. So guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.